Welcome to Expound, our weekly worship and verse-by-verse -verse study of the Bible. Our goal is to expand your knowledge of the truth of God by explaining the Word of God in a way that is interactive, enjoyable, and congregational. We call this a textual community. Let's rejoice and learn God's Word in an interactive and enjoyable new way. I was going to say, open in your Bibles to the Sermon on the Mount, but it's pretty dark except lights in a few places. So we're going to put the scriptures this week up on the screen so that you can follow along, and that is Matthew chapter 5, and we call it the Sermon on the Mount. And if you were with us a couple weeks ago, I explained to you that it's called the Sermon on the Mount because it was preached by Jesus on a rolling hill by the shores of the Sea of Galilee. On the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee, near Capernaum, where Jesus had his headquarters, is this beautiful, you can see it today if you come with us to Israel in the spring, we'll show it to you and we'll actually go over the Sermon on the Mount there. But it's really not a mount, it's just a little hill. And I never liked the title, the Sermon on the Mount, because there's no information in that. It's like me saying my message title today is Sermon from the Pulpit doesn't really tell you anything about it, and so I don't like the title, The Sermon on the Mount. It's much more than that. This is a mountain of a sermon, you might say. This is the sermon of the monarch. This is King Jesus telling us about the kingdom of heaven, how to enter it, and what life is like in it. So this is the kingdom manifesto. And one of the things you notice as you go through this sermon right off the bat is how often it talks about Blessed, that's the word, blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And essentially the word means happy or happiness or blissful or contented. I read an article from Reuters News that said Americans today claim to be less happy than they were 30 years ago. And that's because long hours at work, less satisfying interpersonal relationships make people less happy. Now, I think I can speak for you, at least I hope I can, and say that that is not the case with you, that you aren't less happy today, that you're happier today. And that doesn't mean you have to be giddy and crazy about everything. That's not the happiness I'm speaking about. The idea is an, an inner, steady, blissful contentedness. Now, I realize that the word blessed, that's a, that's a kind of a stuffy sounding word. But the word blessed speaks of, as I mentioned, an inward contentedness. The Amplified Bible renders it this way, blessed happy, to be envied, and spiritually prosperous. Everyone has some idea of what happiness is. Everybody in the world, if you were to say, what would it take to make you happy? In fact, you may want to ask people that you know that very question. Hey, what would it take to make you happy? You'll probably have answers like, well, I would be happy if I made this much money. Or I would be happy if I owned something I've really wanted for a long time. Or I would be happy if I could only marry that person, if I was married to that person. Some others might say, if I wasn't married to that person. <laughs> you know, the Bible has a lot to say about true happiness. I discovered that 56 times in the Bible, the word joy and God are coupled together, or joy and the Lord are coupled together. And essentially, and I'm not being glib, but essentially, from the Bible's perspective, the way to happiness is holiness. True happiness comes from holiness. Now, I know that's another Bible word like blessed. You go, yeah, great holiness, yeah. Sort of, sort of sounds like, Cod liver oil to be, okay, I know i got to take it, and I really don't like it, but it'll make me feel better, and that's how people feel about holiness. I really don't like it. I know I should do it, 
you have no clue then what holiness is, if that's what you think. Jesus is speaking about the, the, the state. He's making a declaration about the inward, spiritually prosperous, joyful, contented state of those who are in the kingdom of God. And it's best summed up by the word blessed. So in chapter 5, verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, and we only made it a couple verses in this chapter last time, and we're not going to make it through the chapter tonight because we're going to take the Lord's Supper. We're just going to read down to about verse 16, Lord willing. And seeing the multitudes, he went up onto a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And on and on it goes nine times, nine sayings of blessed. And something that I want you to mark in your minds. These are proclamations of the Lord. These aren't feelings. These aren't emotions. The idea isn't, I, I really feel blessed. It's not the idea. Whether you feel blessed or not, Jesus is making a proclamation that you are if these things are part of your life. These aren't surface emotions. These are proclamations. The second thing to note about all of these nine proclamations is they're all paradoxical. They don't make sense. Let's see. The happy person is the poor in spirit, the one who mourns over his sin, the one who is meek, the one who gets persecuted. Excuse me, but that does not sound like the recipe for happiness, at least from a worldly perspective. Would you agree? That sort of sounds like to a worldly person, that sounds like misery under another name. That's not the stuff that makes for happiness, most people think. If the world were to write these, they would say, blessed are the wealthy, Blessed are the healthy. Blessed are the beautiful. Blessed are the always tanned. So these are proclamations. These are also paradoxical. Here's something else to note. These are progressive. One leads to the other. If you're poor in spirit, you will mourn. If you're poor in spirit and you mourn, you will be meek. If you're poor in spirit, you mourn and you're meek, you will hunger and thirst after righteousness, etc., etc. They all lead to another. Now, the first two beatitudes, they're called, because of the word blessed, the first two beatitudes speak about entering the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The word we noted last time means poverty-stricken, destitute. I see God, and I see myself, and I recognize I'm spiritually bankrupt, That leads to the second beatitude, I mourn over that condition. And both of these speak of true repentance. That feeling of sorrow that I have failed God and I want to do something about it. And now we come to verse 5, the third beatitude. Blessed, oh how happy, to be envied, spiritually prosperous are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay, when you hear the word meek, probably not the right definition comes to your mind. A lot of people hear the word meek and they think it means gutless, spiritually flabby, as if Jesus is saying, uh, happy are the spineless, they will be doormats for God. That's not what the term meek means. Here's what it means. It means power, that is harnessed. Think of a horse that is extremely powerful, but that horse is put under a harness. It's got a lot of power, but it's under control. And that's the idea of meekness. It's power that is under control. You might say it this way. Blessed are God's gentlemen, or blessed are God's gentle women. They have power, But they choose to be very careful about exercising their power. It is power that is under God's control. Listen, uncontrolled power doesn't do anybody any good. You ever feel like exploding at someone? 
They make you so angry. And some people that don't just feel like exploding, they explode. They just, the atom bomb goes off. The relationship is devastated because of it. So to be meek is to have power, but to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very careful here. I'm not going to blow up. One person put it this way. It's when you idle your motor when you feel like stripping the gears. You're just going to let that idle, idle, that motor idle a little bit, and you're not going to get too carried away. That's the idea of being meek. There was a little girl who wrote an essay for her class at school, and she said this, The Quakers are very meek people. They never fight. They never yell. My mother is a Quaker. My father is not. Here's another way you could look at it. You could take the word meek and cut it in two, and you will get a suitable definition. Me, ech. And I say it's a suitable definition because when you look at yourself after realizing you're poor in spirit and you mourn over your condition, now you look at yourself in that condition and you don't want to dominate And so instead of domineering, you let yourself be controlled by God. Me, eh, me out of the way. God is in control. Then Jesus says in verse 6, Blessed, oh how happy, to be envied, spiritually prosperous are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now stop for a moment. And consider the flow of the passage. If you recognize that you are poverty stricken in God's presence, that you have no hope of your own, no claim of your own, no righteousness of your own, it causes you to mourn over your condition. That's true repentance. That brings a meekness where you are surrendered to God's control. And then you start developing a hunger, new appetites. You crave something different now than you craved before. Hey, you know what the difference is between spiritual immaturity and spiritual maturity? One word, appetite. Appetite. What are you hungry for? A lot of times we ask people, dude, what's your passion in life? What's your passion? Let me ask you a question. What's your spiritual passion like? What do you crave? What do you want? What drives you? That's the idea. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Those are drives. But notice it says hunger and thirst for righteousness. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Notice it doesn't say blessed are those who casually snack after righteousness. You you know, when you snack, it's it's evening, dinner's over, but hey, there's food lying around. You know, it would be kind of nice to to snack. and I really don't want to eat too many of those chips, but a handful would be cool. Okay, that's a casual snack. That's different than saying, I haven't eaten all day, and I'm starving. I'm really hungry. That's an intense spiritual passion. We continue, verse 7, blessed, oh, how happy, to be envied, spiritually prosperous, are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, one of the notable characteristics of our world is that it is mercy-less. It doesn't have much mercy for people. And we're in a political season. And um, on one hand, I enjoy watching it. On the other hand, I wince every time I watch it. Because it seems that candidates, even on the same team in the same political party, aren't very merciful toward one another. They take slap shots and pot shots because what they want people to realize is that I'm a better candidate than that guy. So unfortunately what happens is people in the back rooms, the spin doctors, the strategizers, come up with information about the opponent to put him down, to put her down, to slur them. So that whenever someone comes along who is filled with mercy... They are in stark contrast to everything people have seen that this world has to offer, including politics. 
When true mercy is seen, it's absolutely marvelous. And, and here is Jesus saying, those who are a part of my kingdom are not to be condemners, but givers of mercy. Now, we should condemn sin and we should speak up against it. That's not what it's saying. But our general take on life should be that of mercy because God is merciful. So you get the flow so far? I realize I'm poverty-stricken before God. I mourn over that condition. Um, I become meek. God, I want Him controlling my life. I start hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and I become like God. I'm growing now, and God is merciful, and so I take on those characteristics. You take on those characteristics. You're now becoming more mature because as you've hungered and thirsted for God's righteousness and to be holy and to be like Him, you do become like Him. And one of the things He is, is merciful. Jesus continues in verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, I'd like to explain to you what is, from the Bible's point of view, the definition of the heart. And I think we need to do that because here in the United States, in Western culture, we have unfortunately pitted the heart against the mind. We do it even in church. We say things like, dude, it's not about head knowledge. We need heart knowledge. You can, you can know things in your head, but not in your heart. I, I see Christians do that all the time. They talk about the heart versus the head, as if to say how you feel is more important than what you know. It's not about the mind. It's about the heart. Did you know that from the Bible's perspective, the heart is the mind? It's not the emotion. The heart isn't the emotion in the Bible, only in Western civilization like here. No, in the Bible, the heart is where you think. It's where you develop your motivations. It's the seat of your will. It might include some emotions, but the Bible doesn't talk about the emotions as coming from the heart by the way, does anybody know where the Bible speaks about the emotions coming from? Anybody know? Shout it out if you know. The bowels. Who said that? Do you really believe that? The bowels? That's, it's Ken Costell. He believes that. He's been around a long time. Yeah, the Bible speaks about your emotions coming from your gut, your bowels, your intestines. In the King James, the Bible says, have bowels of tender mercies. When is the last time your bowels were merciful and tender? <laughs> now that's very close to what we consider to be the heart. When Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, he's speaking about your thought processes. Let me give you an example of that just so you think, oh, I don't know if that's true or not. In Proverbs 23, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. When Solomon wrote to his son in chapter 1, 2, and 3, he said, My son, write these truths on the tablet of your heart. In other words, remember them. And the metaphor he used is write them on the tablet like you would write something down on paper. The tablet of your heart, remember them. Jesus Christ said, From the heart come evil thoughts and adulteries, etc., so it's where we think. So here is Jesus saying, blessed, oh, how happy, to be envied, spiritually prosperous, are the pure in heart. The seed of your will, the seed of your thought processes. Notice he does not say, blessed are the pure in action, blessed are the pure in vocabulary, but blessed are the pure in heart. You know why? If God has your heart, he has everything else. If he begins with a core, the inner you, the outer you will typically follow. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it proceed the issues of life. My translation, watch your thoughts. Your thoughts form the blueprints for everything else in life, what you do and what you say. Now, the word pure, blessed are the pure in heart is a Greek word, katharos. We get the term catharsis. It means to cleanse something or to clean something up by removing the dirt. 
when it's applied to the heart, it speaks of an inward purity before God, number one, an inward purity before God, and number two, unmixed sincerity before men. Inward purity with God, unmixed sincerity before people. In fact, one translation of the Bible puts it this way. Oh, how happy are those who are utterly sincere. Another translation I like better. Happy is the one who can live life out in the open. Pure before God, utterly sincere before people. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, when we deal with this verse, blessed are the peacemakers, we're now stepping into mission. Now that God is changing our lives and we're becoming like him, we have that deep spiritual hunger and thirst. We're now stepping into other people's lives. Look at it this way. We become like a bridge making access for two parties to meet each other. Now, this is our calling as Christians. Did you know that you are to be a peacemaker? You say, well, Skip, how can I do that? What do you mean exactly a peacemaker? Well, let me give you four quick categories. Category number one, you make peace with God yourself. You make sure that that everything's clear between you and God. That's salvation. Now, I I take that most all of you have done that. You've made your peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, you help other people make peace with God. Now, that's evangelism. When you help people get right with God, you are now sharing the gospel of grace, helping them to do that. So number one, you get right with God. That's salvation. You help people get right with God. That's evangelism. Here's a third way to do it. You become a peacemaker By making sure you're right with other people. You make peace with other people. Maybe something isn't right between you and a brother or a sister. You do whatever you can, Matthew chapter 18, to reconcile. So the first is salvation. The second is evangelism. The third is reconciliation with people that you've offended or who have offended you. Do the best you can. And the Bible says this way, as much as lies in you, be at peace with all men. I'm glad it said as much as lies in you. Because sometimes you can do everything you can do. You try and you try to make peace with people. They just won't have it. But at least try. Put out the effort. And number four, help other people be at peace with other people. You see, those are the four categories. When you enter into that, now you're a mediator. You're the bridge. You're helping one person who's offended at another person come together. And by your mediatorial words and actions, you bring peace between them. So peace with God, helping other people get peace with God, yourself, peace with people, and helping other people have peace with people. That's what it means to be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called sons of God. Now notice it says they shall be called sons of God. It doesn't say they shall become sons of God. This is not a means to go to heaven. This is not a way to get saved or to be right with God. It says, people who live like this will be called sons of God. In other words, if you really live like this, if I really live like this, people are going to look at your life and go, you must be related to God by by the way you act in making peace toward other people. Okay, so let's put it all together before we get to the next beatitude. You start out humbly, poor in spirit. You mourn over your spiritual condition, asking God for forgiveness. You become meek. You surrender your power to God's control. Instead of being out of control, meekness is God's power under His control, your power under God's control. Then you start developing a new appetite for spiritual things. You hunger and you thirst after righteousness. And when you do that, you become like God, merciful. You become pure in heart, living life out in the open, utterly, truly sincere before men and before God. 
And you help people make peace with one another and with God. And when you live that way, people go, you must be a son of God. You must be a daughter of God. So look at that beatitude again. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called sons of God. Okay, so here's the deal. Jesus is describing life in the kingdom. Here's the king speaking about you and I, subjects in the kingdom, and he's describing us, describing the characteristics of those who live in the kingdom. And he's saying a couple of things. Number one, if you live this way, heaven will notice. Heaven will notice. That's the word blessed. You'll be blessed. Heaven will notice. Number two, people will notice. They will call you sons and daughters of God. Number three, if you live like this, hell will notice. Not just heaven, not just other people. Hell will take notice. And that brings us to our next beatitude. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, when you live the way Jesus just described, the world is going to notice they're not going to like it, and you're going to get persecution. One leads to another. Here is the progression of all that has gone before. Now, persecution is the inevitable clash between two irreconcilable value systems. Let me say that again. Persecution is the inevitable clash between two irreconcilable value systems. The value system of the kingdom of God, that's what we live in, the value system of the world, those two will clash. Or you might say that persecution is the natural consequence from living a supernatural kind of a life or having a supernatural focus. Do you remember what Paul said to Timothy? All those who live godly in Christ Jesus, finish it up, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus, come on, do you, does anybody know that verse? All those who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, will suffer persecution. If you live godly in Christ Jesus, you will be, not might be, you will be persecuted. And so Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted. He assumes that you will be. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when, not if, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Now, there's a qualifying phrase here. You have to be persecuted for what? Righteousness sake. And then in verse 11, Jesus said, for my name's sake. Jesus does not say, blessed are the persecuted, period. There's no blessing in being persecuted. And some people are just weird and obnoxious and in your face. And then people go, dude, you're weird. You're, you're obnoxious. You're in my face. Get out of here. And then that person might walk away going, oh, I've been persecuted for righteousness sake. No, you were persecuted for weirdness sake for obnoxiousness sake, for being in your face sake. Years ago, I remember growing up, there was this guy in Huntington Beach, California on the pier who used to yell at people going, you're going to hell. I never noticed that people were attracted to him. He was even known for grabbing people by their coat, grabbing them and saying, come here. It, it, it didn't work that way. And that's not righteousness sake. And that's not for the cause or sake of Jesus. That's just for being nuts. <laughs> Bad approach. Listen, God wants sharpshooters, not machine gunners. He wants you to aim for the heart. Aim for the life. Aim for change. Get to know that person. Find out what you're aiming at before you pull the gospel trigger. 
There's something else Jesus says in verse 12 about that. He declares you blessed. That's the proclamation. But he says, here's our part. Here's the hard part. Here's the toughest part of this. He says, rejoice. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. I'm not going to ask you when, but I wonder the last time somebody persecuted you, yelled at you, called you a Jesus freak, laughed at you because of your faith in Christ, if you went away going, yes, awesome. In Luke's gospel, when Jesus gives the Beatitudes, he says this, rejoice and leap for joy. Excuse me? Yeah, get really happy. Why? That's the question I want to ask. Why? Two reasons he gives. Look ahead. Jesus says, for great is your reward in heaven. If you're persecuted because you love Jesus and you're living the way it's described here for Jesus, and they persecute you for that, you have a reward coming in heaven. Well, you just have to wait to find out how great it is. But it's great, Jesus said. It's not small. It's great. And there's a second reason you should rejoice. Not only do you have a great reward, but you're in great company. He said, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, they persecuted Jeremiah, and they persecuted Daniel, and they persecuted Hosea and Habakkuk, etc. So you're in great company, and you have a great reward. Therefore, Jesus says, rejoice. So to sum up this portion, how are kingdom dwellers to live? In a word, different. Different. We're different than the world. We're countercultural to the world. We are contramundum against the world different from they are. Now, the last few verses that we want to look at tonight down to verse 16, the next three or four verses, four. Jesus goes from what this person is like to the kind of influence they're going to have. And he says this, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I wonder if you were asked to describe your world, your state, your city, your environment, I wonder what words you would choose. I ask you that because here Jesus describes the world in effect by using a metaphor for us. He says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. Now, since salt, 2,000 years ago, was primarily used to stop decay before the days of freezers and refrigerators, they would take their meat and they would salt it because salt stops corruption, stops decay. When I was a kid, I worked in a place called Hugo's Italian Delicatessen. (laughs) And I was the guy who stocked the shelves and... I was learning how to cut the meat, and I remember a couple of times meat that was left in a place too long and maybe covered up by some boxes and nobody knew. After a while, it started reeking. It was just like, what is that smell? That smell is rotting, corrupting, decaying flesh. And in the old days, they used to rub salt in it to prevent that. So for Jesus to say you're the salt of the earth implies that the world is decaying and corrupt and rotting. And then he says you are the light of the world. And since light was used to dispel darkness, he's implying that the world is dark. So here is Jesus saying the world is rotting, decaying, corrupt, and dark. Tell us how you really feel, Jesus. But here's our influence. We're salt. Here's our influence. 
We are the light of the world. Something else about salt. Salt adds flavor. Sometimes food is pretty dull and tasteless, flat, insipid. But if you sprinkle a little bit of salt, they say it brings out the flavor. Now, I've always thought that chili does that. But people outside of New Mexico don't quite get that. They, oh, no, 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 no. That sort of ruins the taste. No, no, no. It accentuates the taste, makes it even better. But in those days, salt brought out the flavor. This world, this world, have you discovered, is pretty flat and dull. You're to add flavor to it. People are to see your life as the salt, something that, uh, that attracts them toward the meal because you're bringing out the real flavor in the Christian life. And, and something still else about salt. Salt creates thirst. If salt is doing its job, people get thirsty. Several years ago when I was younger and more pernicious to my close friends, um, I would play tricks on them. Uh, when we go out to eat, and on one particular occasion, he was a close friend, and so he sort of picked it up, but it took him a while. Uh, he left the table, and I put some salt in his Coke. And he came back to the table, and he started drinking his Coke, and he, and he didn't say anything. He just tasted it, and he kind of looked a little bit funny, but then he got really thirsty after that. I go, I'm really thirsty today. And so he drank more and more, which made him thirstier and thirstier. And finally, I said, you know what? Uh, I don't want you to drink the whole thing. Let me tell you what I did. I put salt in your Coke. Let me get you water. The meal's on me. The, the next Coke's on me. But, uh, and, and, you know, he said, par for the course. But if salt is doing its job, it creates a thirst. This world lives in spiritual dehydration. We come along and hopefully are creating a thirst for people to want to know who God is and live the kind of a life that we profess. So to sum it all up tonight in our study in Expound, Exposed, the Gospel of Matthew. First of all, we're to be different. All of the things outlined in the Beatitudes show that it's different from the value system of this world. And the fact that we're salt in a decaying place and light in a dark place shows that we're different. Number two, we're to be noticed. Jesus said, when you put light upon a mountain, everybody sees it. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden. So you're different. You're noticed. Number three, you're responsible. The salt, Jesus said, must keep its flavor, its savor. Otherwise, it's really not fulfilling its purpose. It's not really good for much if it's not doing its job. So we have a responsibility, if we are salt, to create a thirst. If we are light, to lead people out of darkness. Which leads us to the fourth and final thing we are. We are necessary. We are needed we are here on this earth for a very, very important mission. When Jesus said to his disciples, you are the salt, you are the light. In Greek, it's in the emphatic plural. And permit me to translate that in its best form. You and you alone are the light of this world. You and you alone are the salt of the earth. In other words, no one else in this world has what you has have. No one else in this world can do what you can do. If people don't see Christ through our lives, guess what? They won't see Christ. We are living ambassadors. We are very necessary. And we are dwelling in the kingdom of God. And someday soon, the Lord is going to return and he will establish a literal kingdom, not just a kingdom in our hearts, not just a kingdom of brotherhood and allegiance to Christ, but a literal worldwide kingdom on this earth. And you will be rewarded. And you will have a position in that kingdom. Pause with me before we uh, take communion and the communion board will get ready to distribute. Let's bow our heads and just in thought, in our hearts, in our minds, consider these things. Lord, just in going over 
some of the things we have heard tonight. As you described the blessed man or the blessed woman, the happy life, the life that is to be envied, you described it as someone who is humble, lowly, in recognizing how great you are and that we have nothing to offer. It causes us to realize our poverty and to mourn over our spiritual condition and to ask Jesus to be our righteousness for his blood to cover our sins. We rely upon that finished work. In so doing, Lord, we find that our lives are changed. Instead of seeking our own agenda and trying to promote our own power scheme or power base, we submit ourselves to your power, our power under your control. And then, Lord, we discover that our appetites change accordingly. We're not hungry for the same things we used to be hungry for. We, we really crave spiritual growth and your righteousness. And then we find ourselves becoming like you, merciful, sincere before men, pure before God, pure in heart. And living that way, Lord, we incur the wrath of the world around us, persecuted. Lord, I pray that you would encourage the persecuted church around the world. We just, in thinking of this word and thinking of them just now, we know that we have brothers and sisters around the globe, like we heard tonight from Slavia and Macedonia and the Balkans and all over the world who are suffering greatly simply because they go to church and they love Jesus and they worship him. And in some places, like the pastor who faced a death penalty in Iran, they pay the ultimate price. We pray you'd encourage them. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us. When somebody laughs at us or scorns us or marginalizes us, to get so excited. Because that's what happened to all of the saints throughout history. We're in good company. And one day... You're going to say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. And we're going to enter into the joy of our Lord, and you're going to give us and lavish upon us great reward. So strengthen us. and Strengthen your people, people in your kingdom around the globe. Lord, we also pray for anyone tonight who doesn't know Jesus here personally. They've been struggling with this. They've heard the gospel. They've come to church, and over and over again, they've just said no. They put it off. They put it off. Lord, I pray they would put it off no longer. I pray that tonight in this place, they would say yes to Jesus. If that describes you, if your heart is crying out to be forgiven by a holy and perfect God who will take your sin and erase it, because he'll put your sin on the Lord Jesus Christ who took your sin and, will, and took your punishment once and for all. If you want to know what it's like to be forgiven, you just right where you're seated, pray in your heart these things. Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I recognize that. I'm sorry for my sin. I pray you'll forgive me. I believe that Jesus shed his blood for me on the cross. And that he died and was buried and rose from the grave. I turn my life to you. I turn from the past. I turn from my sin. I give you my life. I want my life under your control. Help me, Lord. Give me, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And give me your power to live a life that pleases you. From this night onward, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to pass out the communion elements. They're in little flip-top containers, you might say, little uh, pull tabs. We're going to just let you take one, and then we're going to pray, and we're going to take these elements together. So just wait till we all have it. We'll continue in worship in this place. Beautiful night. Worship God from your heart. Let the Spirit bring things to your remembrance just now that 
were said tonight or other things he's been speaking to you about and just use it to worship and commune with the Lord and then we'll all take the elements for communion together. If you would take your peel top communion elements and just peel the first layer off, the translucent white layer, and you'll get to the bread. And um, we're going to pray for the bread and then for the juice separately, like Jesus did the night that he was betrayed and his disciples were in that upper room. I've asked a couple of different people to um, pray for these elements tonight, and these are people that are content to serve behind the scenes. Uh, they're not people who are out in front. We have so many volunteers at this church, like thousands of people who serve behind the scenes. But we have a couple guys that are at every service. And uh, one is Dave Dorrell. He's in our video department. And uh, the other is Jay Fisher. He's in our audio department. And they're mixing sound, and they're making the pictures go on the Internet and recording them, et cetera. But, um, and they're happy to be behind the scenes. They're they're not too stoked about being out in public like this. But every now and then I think it's good to let the Wizard of Oz come from behind the curtain. <laughs> and uh, so we have Dave Dorrell. He uh, runs our video department. And Jay Fisher, our audio department. They're going to pray for these elements tonight. Let's pray for the bread. Heavenly Father, you are the bread of life. And we thank you that you have given your body on our behalf. You. Lord, you are unashamed to hang on that tree and have your body broken so that ours does not have to be. Yes. We take this bread together in celebration of the fact that you love us more than anyone else. In Jesus' name, amen. If you take the second tab and peel it back a little bit, not too quickly, you don't want it to get all over you or your friend next to you. Just peel that back and you'll get to the juice underneath. The fruit of the vine. Father, as you put your son on that cross for us and as his blood flowed to cover everything that any of us have ever done in our lives and all of our sins, we take this in remembrance of that and we want to give you praise for um, sending your son for us and for him dying for us and for his blood washing us clean. Let's drink. Thank you. Thank you guys for serving us. <clears throat> 